again, you may have a prompt uh, for that. Again, welcome. This is July the 21st, 2021, the second in our series of our specialty crop uh, uh, virtual lunch sessions. And we're going to be talking about marketing of specialty crops in, in just a moment. Again, thank everyone for being with us today. We will have these recorded as we go along and get those posted to our CPA website. And I'll let you know when all those are, are there. I know we've had other agents ask about these already, uh, when they can go in and, and watch some of these meetings that we have had. We've scheduled again four of these. This is the second one that we have, are in the process of having uh, this week. Um, this project that we're working on with these crop profiles is a project of the specialty crop block grants uh, through the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. And I believe Debbie Ball is, is with us today from the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. And before we get off, if Debbie has some uh, comments to share, we might ask her to do that uh, a little bit later in our program today. I'm glad that she is with us today also. Uh, for our speaker today on, on marketing of these specialty crops, we've got Dr. Alicia Wren, who is Assistant Professor in Agricultural Resource Economics with UT. It has a focus on, on uh, specialty crop marketing and some niche markets and some value added things as well. And I'm uh, certainly glad to have her with us and her being agreeable to uh, visit with us today uh, and share this knowledge on some of our, our specialty crop uh, products. Uh, as we go along again, as we did yesterday, uh, if you have any questions, if you wanna type those in the chat box, please feel free to do so. Uh, or if you wanna hold them to the end, uh, we will, uh, we will we'll take those questions at the end uh, uh, either way. So Dr. Ren, I've gotten you there as a co-host and if you wanna take control and go from this point, uh, that would be great. Thank you again for being with us today. Sure, thanks for having me, Troy. And thank you all for being here. Can you, can you see my screen? Yes, we're good, looks like. All right, perfect. And I apologize in advance. You might hear some small people screaming, screaming in the background. I'm home today by myself with my kids and they don't quite grasp that concept sometimes that you need to be a little bit quieter. Anyway, so thanks for the introduction. Uh, as you said, my name's Alicia Reen and I'm over in the Ag Econ department. And what really has been driving my uh, research and extension interest has been really looking at niche markets and specialty crop marketing and promotions. And today, just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page, I'm gonna really focus on that marketing mix and marketing uh, promotions in general, as well as pull in a bunch of examples from other specialty crops that I have come across over the years. And then I will also cover some of our green industry trends. My area of specialization is the ornamental industry. So often I will focus on that as my example but feel free to take those ideas, those concepts, and implement them and use them in whatever, um, in whatever way makes sense for you and your firm. So let's start with the marketing mix. And many of you who have had any business courses have likely seen this. And this is the four P's of marketing, which essentially comes down to the items in your business that the manager can control. And they include product, price, promotion, and place. So your product, which is all the way over on the left, that includes all of the, the different elements with that product. So it can be its appearance. What features or attributes does it have? What's its name? And if your company has a brand, what's the brand? How's it represented? What's the logo? And what differentiates your product from the competition? Price, our second P, a lot of us are familiar with that, right? It's, it's readily available in most retail centers. And this, is, this goes beyond just what people are paying for that product, but it's also the value to the buyer. And it often incorporates competitors' prices and the customer's price sensitivity because the idea is people have this reference point in their brain, right? And if you have a price that's substantially higher than that, they're going to walk by your product and not buy it. However, if you're substantially lower than that reference point, you're leaving money on the table and that reduces profitability. Um, price also includes your discounts and sales and promotions related to price. So then that brings us to the third P, which is promotions. And this is everything that entails communicating with that end customer. So how are you communicating? What messages are you communicating? And how is that coming through to that end customer? And this can include your advertising. So what format are you using? What's your timing? What method are you using to reach those folks? 
And same with the timing and location. So when are you promoting and where are you promoting? And then the last P is place. So that's your retail outlet or wholesale outlet, as well as the distribution channels that you and your firm are using. And the key point here is that all four of these are interrelated and often they are based on your company's goal, which goals, which include customer base, the timing, the SKUs, all of that, and your core customer. Who are you going after? What after? What's their behavior? And then what are your competitors doing? Because again, you you want to differentiate, but you don't want to miss your mark because if you don't meet the reference point in the customer's mind, then you can run into a few issues. Um, and again, this these four elements are things that the manager can control. And great managers, I like this quote on the bottom, it's from a colleague of mine. It said that great managers know how to manipulate these four items to maximize their advantage over their competitors. So I wanted to also incorporate the SWOT analysis tool. And this is a great way of analyzing the market environment and look at your marketing planning. And uh, uh, it helps identify different elements that you can build on and others that you may want to address and proactively look at and keep an eye on, right? So the SWOT analysis stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. The strengths and opportunities are helpful while the weaknesses and threats are harmful. And then if you think about whether they're internal elements to your firm or external, the strengths and weaknesses are internal while the external are your opportunities and threats, meaning that you don't have a lot of control over them. So if we think about this though, the strengths can be say, you have a very strong manager with great experience, good soft skills. They can help drive your company to the best of its potential, right? Or location. Here in Tennessee, I think we have a phenomenal location because we're within a day's drive of huge population centers where we can go and sell our products. Uh, reputation, again, building on anything that you've done well in the past and keeping it going on into the future and building that amongst your uh, clientele. And then weaknesses, let's just say, okay, you're very busy. So it's tough to get everything done that you want done in a day. So it's something to be aware of and potentially be hiring more employees. Or maybe there's funding problems. You know, the weaknesses are individual to the firm, just like strengths and the others. But this is just a few examples I could think of off the top of my head. Then opportunities, these could be grants, federal, state, um, any grants that are available to you. This also includes trends. So your customer in industry trends. Right now, for example, I have a picture of Bonnie's plants over here. Um, edibles, grow your own food movement is a huge customer trend. It's been going on since about, well, right around the Great Recession, but it's continuing on and it's drawing in a younger uh, core customer to the industry, which helps, uh, helps stimulate some of the demand for the products. Um, and then threats, this could be competition. It could be substitution or alternatives. It includes the economy, right? So ornamental plants are closely tied to the housing market. And the recession, when that happened, that kind of kicked the legs out from everyone. And so that was a huge threat that not a lot of us saw coming, but when it did, it hit pretty hard. And then more recently, supply availability. We've had some supply chain disruptions here in the past year because of COVID. And that's become an issue, but we're handling it as we're going through. Um, I wanted to touch on target marketing and essentially the concept here is that you have customer segments that respond similarly to stimuli and they tend to be drawn to specific product attributes based on some of their needs and wants, right? And so those specific segments of the population are considered your target market when you are targeting them with your advertising promotions and product mix. Um, there are three steps to the target marketing process. The first is segmentation, so identifying who you want to uh, target and what, what really makes up that market. You know, What's their age? What's the gender? What's the disposable income? Why are they an attractive segment to you? How are you going to reach them? And what needs do your products and services address for that group 
that's different than your competition. The second one was, uh, second step here is evaluate those segments and decide which to go after. And the third is position your product or service to meet their needs and then adjust your marketing mix so it aligns with their needs and creates that competitive advantage. Often, um, these target markets are based on either socio-demographics or socioeconomic traits. It could be geography, maybe, maybe a brick and mortar retailer. And really, you want to attract people from a 20 mile radius around you. So that would be your core consumer. And as such, you, you would be very familiar with some of the promotion opportunities in that area and how to draw them in. Um, some other areas that can be used to differentiate your segment is looking at the consumer's attitudes, values, beliefs, interests, any of these elements that you can use to connect with them and better understand their needs and wants. Or they might be needs-based. Um, maybe you have a landscape company that works with wetland restoration. Well, there is a specific segment that would find that of interest and often they will seek you out. So some things to consider when thinking about target marketing is with that segment, what is the size and what's the potential for growth? If you have hit your capacity and really can't grow your business much more, is that segment a size that can be sustainable for you and your company? And are you, or do you want to grow? In which case, is there a segment that is going to grow with you or do you need to expand some of your reach? Um, structural attractiveness is does it fit with your company and compatibility with your objectives and resources as well, because really, if you don't align, you probably shouldn't be targeting that group, right? There are several benefits to using target marketing strategies, and the big one is the efficiency, that you can target a group and tailor your message and marketing mix to meet their needs, and as a result, you have a more targeted approach and that reduces the resources that are required there, whether it's time, financial, or other resources. This all aids in building consumer awareness for your product. It can help build brand equity and ideally loyalty because it costs a lot less to retain an existing customer than to go out and try and recruit a new customer. And ultimately, this also facilitates a deeper understanding between you, your firm, and your customer base, which then can help you be a little more proactive in moving forward and attracting more customers and more sales. And the third step with the target marketing strategy is all about positioning. So I wanted to include um, the steps in developing a positioning strategy. So the first one is analyzing your competitors' positions. And this is really being aware of what's going on in your market and where do you fit in that market. Um, secondly is offer good or service that has a competitive advantage, meaning that it's different than what's currently being offered and that you are doing it better than your competition. Third, match elements of your marketing mix to the select segment. And then fourth, evaluate their response and modify as needed. So my example here is just add ice orchids. And I'm not sure how many of you have heard of this particular brand, but I like using it as an example because it first came to my attention back in the early 2000s. And they took orchids, which if you think about perceptions of orchids, and I asked students this last semester what their perceptions of orchids were. And the response was that they're expensive. They're finicky. You can't water them too much or you can't underwater them. They require a different soil structure, which is unfamiliar. You can't just put it in a potting soil or potting media and call it good. They require something else. They, I think I said expensive already, but regardless, they're considered expensive. They're considered fragile. They are considered not <laughs> reblooming. You know, all of this is kind of negative. It's intimidating. And that was kind of the sense you get from people that orchids are intimidating, which is a huge barrier. Well, this company took this product and they really broke that down. Essentially, they came up with this concept of, okay, to care for an orchid, it's fairly easy. All you have to do is water it a little bit. Well, okay, how do we make that uh, relatable and easy for the consumer? The KISS method, keep it simple, right? And they came up with this concept of, well, add three ice cubes once a week. Oh, well, that's easy enough, you know? They made it really, really approachable so that people anywhere 
could grow this product. And what was interesting is this particular image is an end cap. And they had these available in big box stores, Lowe's, Home Depot. They had them at the grocery store at Target. And these plants were only about $5. So a lot of different people all of a sudden had access to them. They were given very simple instructions on how to care for them. And they also, if they wanted it, you can see it here, they have a ton of social media presence where they could go and seek out additional information if they wanted it. Now, this company also took it a step further and analyzed the responses they were seeing in the market. So this page is from their marketing report. And again, right up here at the top, you can see our orchids need three ice cubes once a week. It's just that simple. They were reiterating, everyone can take care of an orchid. Everyone can have one of these in their house. It's, it's okay, we can do this. But what was interesting, if you look at this orchid knowledge level, 65% of their customers were beginners. They had no experience here. 78% said it was their first orchid purchase. And if you look over here at rating your experience, right around 80%, a little bit over actually, said this is good to excellent and I would do this again. And if you look at their purchasing behavior, a lot of them indicated that, okay, we bought one, but all of a sudden we're increasing to two and three. And here's how many I purchased in the last couple of months. There was an increasing trend amongst beginners in buying these. They were having a positive experience. And that's something that we could all take with our, um, our own products is how can we improve the customer experience? We're moving into an experiential culture rather than uh, owning items culture, right? And for plants, that's an amazing opportunity and we see a lot of people incorporating them more in their lives than they have in the past. And I'll talk a little more about that here in a minute. Okay, so let's circle back to this product mix. And for the products, the first P, there's a lot of different elements to consider. So what does your customer want from that product? So I have a picture of apple trees. Ideally, they're going to want apples, right? They're going to want this product to survive. They're going to want to have a positive experience. Um, second, what features does it have to have to meet those needs? Well, I like this example because we have this product tag here that provides all of that information. Here's what you need to know in order to be successful in growing this plant. Give it space, give it the water it needs and other things. And it, you too can have apples in your backyard. And then how and where will the customer use it? Well, for us, it's fairly easy, right? They tend to use it in their own, uh, gardens or landscapes, what does it look like? And then how is it branded and differentiated from the competition or alternative products that are available? Is What type of apple is it? Uh, when does it produce? Does it have other benefits? Is it pollinator friendly? Uh, is it organic? All of these are different points that can be used to differentiate your product. And that actually ties into my next slide here, which is the marketing of value. Now, for the consumer, the price is not the value. The value is all of the benefits that he or she receives from buying that good or service. So it's your tangible product itself and all of its features and attributes, but it's also intangible items and attributes related to that product. It can be that sense of feeling good because I grew my own apple. You know, that is a very valid value point for that product. And then the value proposition is the whole bundle of benefits that the firm promises to deliver and not just the benefits of the product itself. This is encompassed with your competitive advantage. So what are you doing better than the competition? It highlights your distinctive competencies and the differential benefits. So what makes your product superior to everyone else's? Um, on the right-hand side, I have a picture of a tomato plant. And some of you may have uh, attended some of my other presentations, so this will be familiar for you. But just looking at that tomato plant, you, you can't tell much about it. Again, I presented this to the students and they told me, well, it's a tomato transplant. It's in a four inch pot. It's getting a little leggy, probably needs some sun and it probably needs to be put outside. And they were right. But what you don't see is all of the 
uh, attributes that are not promoted. If we don't promote what's unique about that product, we don't know just by looking at it and it's leaving it up to the customer to guess. So for instance, this one actually had yellow tomatoes. Please forgive my uh, limited Photoshop abilities, but it is a point of differentiation that could make this product more valuable and more desirable to the end consumer. Additionally, it was a non-GMO product as well as organic. So you may not fall in the segment where you think these are ideal attributes for you as a person, but if you're targeting a customer segment that is, there are all ways of adding value and differentiating your product. So the moral here is do good work, talk about it and communicate it at the point of sale to your customer because they don't know unless you're actively giving them that information when they're making their purchasing decisions. Um, so all of this could be uh, communicating any benefits and value related to that product. It could be company values. So corporate social responsibility is huge now. There's a particularly among consumers that are in the younger age cohorts, they really value environmental stewardship and uh, other sustainability initiatives. And it also includes any benefits that that product can provide them. So for example, some of the marketing of value can be related to the product itself. So uh, indoor foliage plants, houseplants are a very hot topic right now. People love houseplants and I'll talk about this when I get to the trends, but there's a lot of um, information out there right now for customers to make the right choice and see the value of having these in their lives. So I just pulled this up from a Google search and it's talking about the snake plant. And essentially it talks about these benefits where it emits oxygen and absorbs carbon dioxide at night while removing formaldehyde, trichloroethylene and benzene. So all the volatile organic compounds, well, a portion of the volatile organic compounds, which are air pollutants. And in turn, this improves breathing. It defends against airborne allergens and it improves air quality. And beyond that, they also provide this great little uh, infographic saying that it's easy to grow. Now, we're all probably familiar with how slow these plants actually grow. So if you buy it with a specific uh, area to put it with this visual um, decor that you wanted it to go with, it's not gonna change and it's easy to dust. You know, They don't point out those benefits, but they are benefits. Um, they can also include uh, aspects of what your company is uh, supporting. So non-GMO, fair flora, fair trade, organic, recycling, um, carbon footprint re reduction. All of these are different ways to add value for that customer group. And again, there needs to be alignment between what you decide to pursue and promote and your target market and what they value. So a key point here is in order to purchase value must be uh, at a minimum greater than an alternative. Okay, so this brings us to our, sorry guys, and this brings us to our next key place. So this is where do buyers look for your product or service? Um, so if you think about the last time you went to buy something uh, and it wasn't where you expected it to be, how many trips did you take to somewhere else, another retail environment to um, find that product? So for instance, let's say you're looking for a lemon tree and you go to an independent garden center and they don't have it well, then you may continue on to another one or you may, well, nowadays it's easier to find these things online. So you may end up going to an online outlet in order to purchase that product. Um, excuse me for one second, guys. Okay, <laughs> so... If they look at the store, what kind of store? How can you access the right distribution channels? And then 
do you need to use a sales force, right? If you're, for instance, a landscaper, the sales force really helps make it an individual experience and helps uh, integrate clients' ideas into that landscape and what the customer ultimately wants. And then what do your customers do and how can you differentiate it from the competition? On the right-hand side here, you see this pie chart that essentially shows where people tend to buy plants from. And often in research, we'll see similar proportions here where the majority tend to buy from big box stores. They're convenient, they're accessible. Um, while it's followed by the independent garden centers and then some of the other uh, retail outlet options. And what's interesting here is that people have different perceptions of plants from these different outlets. So for instance, um, people going to independent garden centers are expecting a broader variety. They're expecting a higher quality product and they also expect them to be a little more uh, pricey. Interestingly though, when they go to the big box store, they view it as being convenient as having, so if they wanted to buy five flats of the same type of plant, they often will try it for the big box store because they usually have that quantity. Um, so it's interesting because you have slightly different market segments depending on which retail outlet you go to. Oops. And of course, there's a bunch of different retail or a bunch of different outlets depending on what your target market is, right? So wholesale, we have shippers, packers, brokers, grower co-ops, retail buyers, and other terminal markets. Retailers, we have all the ones from the previous list, as well as your farm direct options, such as pick your own farmer's markets, CSAs, and more recently, e-commerce, right? Um, and I wanted to include this uh, example because it's a marketing strategy for small marketers targeting retail opportunities. And I included a picture of American Beauty, an American Beauty's uh, native plant display because even though a lot of the plants that are out there are natives, they're not always uh, promoted or advertised as natives. So as a result, this is a value added niche marketing strategy, even though some of these products like, for example, the purple cone flower, a lot of retailers have that. It's fairly easy to find, but it's not always promoted as native. And unless you're familiar with it, you don't always recognize it as native. Um, so some of the other elements that tend to be unique here are quality products, value added products. Often the owner's identity or firm's identity is integrated. So talking about having a history in that area of um, getting to know your farmer. Um, factors similar to that really kind of drive home that value. And it's something that's, um, that's a valuable information, especially for younger uh, clients. Agritourism could be included in this, as well as more services, collaboration opportunities, joint ventures, and alliances. Um, this brings us to the next P, which is price. And price is interesting because it's, it's pretty complex, right? So you have revenue, which is the price of that product times the quantity of plants sold. And price itself can impact that quantity sold. So if you have a low price, you sell more plants, but, and this spreads out your fixed costs. So rent, overhead, things like that, over more units. So you reduce your cost per unit but you may be making less revenue because you have a lower price point. Conversely, a high price results often in decreased quantity sold and it spreads fixed costs over less units. So your cost per unit increases, but you end up with more revenue. So really as a company, you need to be aware of what, what segment you're targeting, what their price sensitivity is and what, um, what works best for you and who you're trying to reach. There are several uh, pricing strategies that are out there. Some of these work a little bit better in the specialty crop industry than others, but there's a variety that you can think about. And it's not, it's not always an adopt the whole uh, strategy. Sometimes you can pick elements that work well for you and 
um, go from there. So for example, um, competitive pricing, this is where you base your price on competitors' prices. And this may or Karen, thank you. This may or may not be price matching, but you may strategically think about whether you want to be above or below market price and your competitors' prices. Um, if you think about value-based pricing, this is where you set your price level with or slightly below the perceived value in order to drive up the quantity sold. And some of the perceived value elements, again, you can see what other people are, or what other firms are charging. There, are, there is some research out there looking at the premiums people are willing to buy for these different attributes. Um, or you could maybe conduct some preliminary research on your own to see what interest there is amongst your customer base. Discount pricing is where you reduce the price from the listed price. Often in our industry, we see this as seasonal discounts, right? So end of season, you need to move product, you drop the price, but you show the original price too because people realize, oh, I can get a deal. Or there could be volume discounts. You see this with, uh, for example, landscape, where they're trying to buy product in to fill that landscape, but you want to have some consistency through, so you buy a larger amount. Could be cash discounts, um, trying to get away from paying that fee for using credit cards, or the early order discounts, another one. Then there's lost leader pricing. This, this one's a little more relevant um, to uh, grocery stores, where you have a reduced price for a limited amount of time in order to draw customers in who then spend money on other products that are also there. And I, I find this interesting, the psychological pricing. People find odd numbers at the end of the price as more attractive than a whole number. For example, having something end with 99 cents or 95 cents rather than on the dollar. Um, and then prestige pricing, this is where you set a high price. And this product then has that perception of being high quality or elite. You see this in cars, right? With your BMWs, Mercedes, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is really intended for a, a certain clientele, right? They tend to be pursuing more that niche item, that high end item. Um, and for this one to work, the value has to be greater than the alternatives that are available. So this brings us to the last P of the marketing mix, which is promotion. And this is where and when can you get across to marketing messages to your target market. The same promotion channel does not work for everyone. Um, particularly, for example, right now, there's a lot of live streaming and um, satellite radio. So trying to get a commercial across the radio to a customer is a bigger challenge than it has been in the past. Conversely, social media is a really good platform, especially if you're going after a younger core consumer who tends to spend a lot of time online. Uh, the average American adult spends over 70% of their time on a computer when they're awake. So that could be a potential way of getting a hold of your customer group. Um, when is the best time to promote? And I'll talk about that in a minute here because our products are highly seasonal. So you want to promote when people are thinking about plants. And then how do your competitors do their promotions and does that influence your choice of promotional activities? Do you want to align with them? Do you want to do something different? And I'm realizing I'm using a lot of orchids as examples here, but it, it's what I had available at the time. On the right, we have a Valentine's Day orchid special. Again, you can see that psychological pricing of $9.99 instead of 10. Um, you can see that they're advertising that they have over 350 orchids in stock. So if you're interested in an orchid, or Valentine's Day or any other time, you may want to visit them because they have a, a variety of selection, right? And then they also uh, advertise a few other options that they have available. But it's just kind of to give you an idea of some of the promotions we see. Um, in terms of timing, I really like this graphic. The green shows when customers are thinking about purchasing plants, whereas the yellow is when they are actually purchasing. 
and you can see that they start thinking about it in spring, you know, as February uh, goes on and on and on, they start thinking about putting plants in the ground. However, we've got that last frost date, right? So people actually, they'll start purchasing, a few early birds will start purchasing, but often they'll delay until that, uh, until that last frost date. And that's when you see a lot of the sales pick up. But then by mid July, about where we are now, your sales are dropping because most people are not selling or are not buying for this time of year. In terms of the promotional strategy, there's really three key steps. First, identify your core consumer. Who's your target audience? Um, are they decision makers or is there a key influencer you could reach out through? Um, I'm not sure how, uh, and by influencer, I mean someone who is gone to as an expert. It could be extension uh, folks. It could be someone else who's out there in the industry. It's not necessarily what you think of as a pop culture influencer, okay? Um, but it could be. Second, communicate your objective. So what are you thinking? Do you want them to do an immediate purchase? Are they gaining information? What is it that, they, that you're trying to accomplish through this promotion? Design your message with that in mind and then also provide some sort of attention grabber that will help disseminate that objective. And then identify your communication channel. Are you using social media? Are you using radio, um, print media? Uh, and then allocate your resources accordingly. Um, there are several distinct reasons why you would advertise. First is increase awareness and differentiate your product. If people are not aware of your product, they're not going to buy it. Um, if they don't know about your company, you kind of get lost in the background. There's this thing called plant blindness where people don't necessarily notice plants, but if you start promoting and getting out in front of them, then all of a sudden they'll start noticing a little bit more. And then also, of course, differentiate. That's a very key point here. And then increase consumer perception. So you want to improve their perceptions of your company and your product. Perception um, perception's interesting because perception is reality. So whatever your perception is, whatever your core customer group's perception is, that is their reality. And for example, I had already talked about uh, mass marketers versus local garden centers and how people have very distinct perceptions of the products, qualities, and who is purchasing from those uh, different locations. And all of these essentially build up to increasing demand for your product um, amongst customers. Okay, so that's marketing 101 in a very brief time frame. Uh, but I also wanted to touch on some industry trends. So this is from the USDA NAS data set, and it's showing U.S. ornamental horticulture wholesale values between 1988 and 2019. And what I thought was interesting here, if we look at the trends over time, in floriculture, over 20 years, we saw about a 32% increase. Over 10 years, we saw a 9.5% increase. In the past five years, it decreased a little bit, but you can still see that we're kind of going on the upward trajectory here. In the nursery industry, which this is particularly uh, relevant for Tennessee, since we have a very strong nursery production uh, firms in the state, what we saw was a 20% increase over 20 years, a 15% increase in the last 10 years, and then a 6% increase in the last five years. And part of this, again, connects back to that housing market that as people are building houses, they're putting in landscapes, you know, and people don't build a house and not put in a landscape. That's, that's kind of a nice uh, feature. But also, if you're buying a house, you're updating, you're changing the landscape because maybe it's a 1970s house. And I can tell you when I bought a 1970s house, I tore out the shrubbery and put in new because I wanted that updated look. And my preferences were different than the builder's preferences that was originally with that house. So that's where we're sitting in terms of wholesale value. Now, I also have a couple slides looking at sales. And these are from the 2021 growing season from the Grower Talks Acres Online. And what he did, does is every uh, weekend during the growing season, 
he has retailers and growers rate their sales on a 10 point scale. And this, um, this is the full season. In the US, they rated it as an average of 8.2 and in Canada, 8.1, so sitting pretty good. In Tennessee, you can see that on average, we were rated at an eight. So we're sitting really well. And you can see it over in this green box, they show 2021 ratings versus 2020. April in 2021, we were at an 8.4. In 2020, they were at a 6.8. Well, if you think back, that's when the pandemic first hit, lockdown was going on. We weren't sure what was going on. Consumer confidence was low, so they weren't spending money. But then in May in 2020, we bumped up to a 9.1. And in 2021, we were at an 8.8. .8. So confidence came back. People were spending money. They wanted plants. This was great news. And then interestingly, in 2020, the, six, the season kind of drew out. So in June, they rated it an 8.3 versus 2021. It was a little low, still good but things kind of are getting back to normal in 2021 in terms of spending uh, habits compared to 2020 where people wanted to be outside, they wanted to garden, they wanted uh, this escape from working at home. And then in addition to the actual scores, he also took the gut scores. So how did the industry feel they were doing versus what they actually were rating every single weekend? And what was really cool here is if you see Tennessee, we rated a 10. And you can see that up through the West Coast and then up in Canada too. As an industry, we are very enthusiastic about how 2021 went. And I think that's a phenomenal indicator of how well we felt this year was going and went for us. I included uh, two quotes. The top one I included because it was Tennessee. You know, we got to stay loyal here. And... <laughs> It's from the weekend of June 19th through 20th. And this person indicated that they were gonna give it a six because it wasn't as good as 2020. But when they went back to a normal year, so 2019, they were more than double. So things were still going very, very well. And this Minnesota one I included because it's actually an e-commerce firm of trellises. And what they saw, so they don't sell just in Minnesota, they sell across the country. And what they saw was that their sales were up 150% over the same time frame in 2020, indicating that at least for this particular firm, uh, demand was up, particularly um, for the e-commerce industries. Okay, so I wanted to touch on some specific consumer behavioral changes we saw due to COVID. And um what we found so excuse me there like i said I, I get wonderful background noise today um <laughs> so this was a study looking at local small businesses and some of the features that they offered and the consumers reactions to those features and what they found was that 80% of customers wanted local businesses to continue offering curbside pickup. Now bear in mind, this isn't specific to the specialty crops industry, but it does give you some indicators of things that we could think about continuing on to the future. 78% uh, said they would like to continue offering contactless payment. I think that this one is something that is here to stay now and in the future as people have become more conscious of germ transfer and ease of uh, checking out products. So this would be one that if I was, uh, if I had my own firm, I'd be interested in thinking about seriously for future uh, retail opportunities. This graphic shows online and in-store sales and how they uh, changed over, over the years. So we have February, 2019, the gray is the online sales, the green is in-store sales. Well, you can see where the pandemic hit and impacted consumer um, perceptions here. So online went up, in-store went down, but then they gradually kind of came back together. And what we saw this spring though, was that they took a dip because of supply chain and labor issues. Um, and the second honeycomb graphic shows in-store sales 
and year over year growth with the orange being a negative and the green being positive. And what's kind of interesting is you can tell where consumer confidence came back here in mid to late March. And we shifted more towards green and away from orange. Now the ornamental plant industry is in this home category. And what we saw is that it stayed green throughout and other firms that were green stayed green as well. And what this indicates is that rather than people going out and sh shifting what they're spending money on, they're buying both. So there isn't substitution occurring, rather they're spending more money in general. So this is a very good sign. Um, supporting evidence also showed that in August 2020, compared to August 2019, building materials and gardens were up about 15%. When compared to July 2020, it was up 2%. So again, people are interested, they're buying these products. In the United States, we saw 2020 retail plant sales up 23 to 37%. In Tennessee, we were sitting right around 31% compared to 2019. And then this shows Google search trends. The blue is the garden, garden term, while red indicates landscaping. And you can see the seasonality. So spring and summer came, and then we hit the end of the growth season and winter. And then we hit that again. So we have waves of interest. But look at 2020 compared to the previous years. We had a huge bump in interest for both gardening and landscaping. And then in 2021, so I, I extracted this data a month ago, we still saw an increase compared to previous years, just not as high as 2020, which indicates that people are still interested. We brought in new gardeners and they are still looking for that information. It's just not as high as the previous year. But when you look at that in 2020 compared to 19, 18, and 17, we're still doing fairly, fairly well. Um, we conducted a study showing that people shifted their plant purchasing behavior in 2020, which intuitively that makes sense, right? So we had an increase in online purchases, particularly among box stores and mass merchandisers. We also saw an increase in curbside pickup, but this was higher for independent garden centers. So we kind of had two different, again, I suspect this comes back to who's going and what are they purchasing and kind of having different segments that they're targeting. And then if you look at the pie chart on the right, what we found was the majority of people were planning on going back to their pre-pandemic purchasing behaviors. Well, only 18% were gonna be continuing on with what they were doing after the pandemic started. And a quarter of the sample said they were going to use a little bit of both depending on what they uh, enjoyed the most. And what we found was that those who shifted to online shopping were less likely to revert to pre-pandemic habits. And likely this occurred because either they gained familiarity, right? So they started trusting that they were getting a high quality product through that method, or it also increased availability. If you don't live near a garden center, all of a sudden you were able to access those products that prior to having them online, you just weren't able to easily access. The second point here was that folks who were going and buying at curbside were more likely to revert to pre-pandemic habits. And what we suspect is happening here is that these are the folks that live nearby, so it's more available to them to go and shop. But secondly, they view it more as an outing, as an experience, and they enjoy it. So in, it would make sense then that as places open up again, they go back to that brick and mortar store. All right, so let me just wrap up with a few of our shopping and product trends that we are seeing out there now. And what's interesting, this, this one does tie back into uh, the pandemic trends that we were seeing. In 2019, the National Gardening Association found that 14% of garden shopping was done online. And so we saw that bump up in our survey during the pandemic, but, um, Let's see. But we also saw that, okay, that if you look at the second point here, often they draw parallels between the ornamental plant sales and grocery sales. They saw curbside pickup by 90% during quarantine. 
And they connect that they expected that online gardening or that curbside pickups of gardening sales ha uh, had a similar trend. But they also found that people were spending more during lockdown. So that was kind of an interesting trend that I think there's a lot of opportunity there because I think people are also going to be spending more moving out of uh, quarantine. But there was a focus on convenience and speed for the product and for being able to shop that really before the pandemic wasn't always there, at least not universally amongst consumers. Um, in our industry, we saw a lot of new people come into the marketplace. Um, so we saw that more than half of American adults were spending two additional hours a day outside during quarantine. Um, we saw that 16 million new people were trying gardening, and many of them were in this younger segment. They were under 35 years old. And then according to that National Gardening Association survey, People who were between 35 and 44 years old had the highest spending on gardening products at about $609 a year. And so this group is changing a little bit in that they're buying houses, they're having families, they now have established careers, so they have spending power and they're coming into the marketplace and expressing interest in plants. Um, in terms of product trends, I mentioned this already, but indoor foliage plants, house plants, they have been hot and they've been getting there for a while. All of these show Google searches for these eight different uh, indoor foliage plants between 2010 and 2018. You can see they're all upward moving. Um, there's also been a lot of interest in bringing nature indoors. People are recognizing that plants reduce stress and that they can enhance the sense of creativity and space. And then I don't have my background on today, but a lot of people with Zoom meetings like having some greenery in the background, right? And so that's been a nice uh, side benefit for the company or for the industry as well. This is um, on the left, you see the full infographic, this hashtag stay planted. And it's all about improving productivity through bringing plants indoors in the work environment. So it increased productivity, higher levels of well-being, higher levels of creativity, improves concentration, um, being able to retain companies or companies, being able to retain employers or employees and having them be healthy and happy in the workplace. Um, sustainability, and I just cut this out again from the Grower Talks Acres Online, and this is from Cultivate, which took place last week, where they were talking about proven winners launching a biodegradable pot that also provided nutrients to the plant while it grew. Um, sustainability is a big um, push, especially among consumers and younger consumers. Those folks who are spending those uh, high dollars and have kids are very interested in environmental and local and helping out uh, the economy through buying products that are socially responsible too. Tiny plants, these are hot products, um, especially if they have multiple purposes, whether uh, improving your environmental decor, providing food, uh, health benefits, anything along those lines. Uh, people have smaller yards now so if you can have a product that's miniature, but producing a lot of, say, tomatoes, that is going to be very popular amongst customer groups. Um, the Grow Your Own Food Movement is very popular, still popular, and this one's probably going to continue for a while. 67% of adults are growing or plan on growing uh, edible plants with vegetables, uh, capturing the majority, followed by fruits and or herbs and fruits. Blueberries are very popular because people can successfully grow them in containers on a patio as well. And then this, this is my uh, last trend slide. And what I thought was interesting here is that these online influencers have seen a 400% growth um, and they're being inundated with questions. So prior to the pandemic, this person, Timothy Hammond, a big city gardener, would receive one message every few days, but now he receives dozens on basic gardening tips. He gained 10,000 followers in six weeks. 
So there's a lot of interest and there's a lot of different ways people are uh, reaching out to gather information about these products. So just as a quick recap and then I'm done, uh, know your four Ps, know your marketing mix, align it with your company goals, align it with your target market and what you do well to differentiate your product. Know your product's value, communicate it with the value proposition, again, differentiate. And then uh, promote your products at the appropriate time through appropriate channels and be aware of the changing marketplace and trends that are occurring, what your customers interested in and adjust your marketing mix and your product offerings accordingly. And with that, thank you all for, for, for coming to my presentation. And uh, I think I may have time for questions. Thank you, Dr. Ren. We appreciate that, that uh, especially those chart graphics at the at the end, all of it, but especially those things and how those things all relate back to uh, the COVID situation and things that we've seen. It's It's been kind of strange to see what came out of that and the trends and things that have happened in a lot of different areas with that. So thank you for thank you for doing that. Uh, I know we had one person on the call that sent me a message. They had something come up and they had to, they had to step out and leave. We do have, an, we do have another, uh, Dr. Ren, there's one that did ask if we can get a copy of this presentation. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think I can do that. I, uh, Troy, would are you, should I send it to you? Right, if you want or, to send it to me, yeah. that'd be fine. I'll okay. get it to if that's okay. Yeah, that All should right. be fine. Good. And I mean, we have a recording of it. I, I do apologize for the right. background noise. It's no problem. No problem. Don't worry about that at all. We're good. We're good. Any other questions while, uh, at the present time? If not, this will be, this is recorded. Um, and Lisa has no worries. Everything's good. So <laughs> I appreciate, appreciate that. that. You we'll, guys are amazing. And we'll get the presentation, we'll get the presentation out. Uh, we do appreciate your time and, and uh, for all the information that was given to us. That's will be very helpful, I think, to, to everyone and to the, to the industry as well. Um, I think um, we're getting close to time, but um, I want to, Debbie, do you have anything you would like to say about the special crop block grants from TDA or anything along those lines? I'll give you a minute, minute or so if, if you if you would like to. Um, well, hello, everybody. I don't I don't have anything, certainly don't have anything to add to this presentation, which was excellent. And I can't wait to get my copy of it because there's some of those stats I got to go back and look at again because they were really impressive. Um, we're tickled that we can, uh, the Department of Ag is tickled that we're able to support this project through the Special Crop Block Grant Program. And I, I do wanna say, I see some producer names on here. Um, sometimes this is overwhelming. This information is good, but it's overwhelming. How are you gonna remember all those Ps? How are you gonna do everything? Um, and my advice is, is go back, look at the presentation and take it one thing at a time. Um, I, Dr. And you may, we were actually been emailing this morning about something else, <laughs> but um, I, I'm sure you will, will validate that to, to not try to bite off everything all at once, but to, to pick one thing at a time and focus on it and then, and then move on to the next. But we're thrilled to be able to support this program and um, good job. Thank you, Debbie. Thank uh, your support and TDA support as well, and and for helping us at the center on many other occasions and, and things that we do as as well. Thank you, thank you for that. We we had time yesterday, and we we did kind of look at our website very quickly from CPA and some of the crop profiles that we have there, and connected that with the Center for Crop Diversification in Kentucky. Uh, we will pause. We won't do that today because of time, and 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 that's fine. We will have a couple of chances next week. We talked about pollinators yesterday. We talked about marketing today. We're going to look more at a couple of the uh, specific profiles and some of the information next Tuesday and Wednesday. Cut flowers on Tuesday. Rachel Painter from Rutherford County will present that. And I think Rachel's on the call today with us. And then the 28th, we'll talk about garden mums um, uh, at, at uh, that time. Lucas Holman from Wilson County will be giving us information on that as well. Uh, that gets us to 101. Mindful of your time. Thank you for being here today. Uh, Dr. Wren, thank you for all that information that you've given to us as, as well. Uh, and I hope everyone can join us uh, next week on the 27th at the, at the same time. Thank you for being here today. And John Goddard's on the call. I'm going to stop this recording yesterday. We kind of started, we kept talking and still recorded some of our things. So we're going to stop the recording and 